Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Darren Mitchell and we're going to talk about how typical financial planning has failed most real estate investors and how you can make a change and potentially end up with a different result. I'm so excited that Darren's here to share his knowledge with us. Before we get into it with Darren, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And I know there's going to be a lot of comments and questions after this session. So without further ado, let's jump in, Darren. So great to have you here. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to join us. And why don't you give us a bit of an intro on who you are and what you do uh, before we jump into our topic today? Sure. Uh, so Darren Mitchell, I've been in the financial services uh, sector for 25 years, I guess now, right out, of, right out of my MBA, moved to Toronto and started working in the financial services business and went through several several different changes in, in careers. And, and really, uh, 2008 was really when the big, the big change happened. But um, Married, couple kids, great life. <laughs> and you're based out of Halifax. So we were just talking a little bit before we hit the record button. Um, and you're a real estate investor. You wrote a book. It's called Be the Bank. I'm about three quarters of the way through it. I love it. It's a really great book. Um, and it really breaks down. And I think that's, you know, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, it starts with, you know, what's wrong with the system. And that's my first question for you. I want you to dive in on this. Um, but what is, what is the thing that's failing most investors and most even uh, individuals in Canada and why are they not achieving the financial goals that they're hoping to achieve? Yeah, uh, great question. So like when, when, when 2008 happened and I uh, was salmon fishing in Alaska at the time, but 2008 happened, I'm up there and, and I'm, I'm driving to a, a hill to get cell coverage every hour to see how much the market was crashing and, and, and I had no control. Um, and then I realized my clients had no control and I had no control over their money. So I, I, I decided to really look at things differently. And I thought of every single wealthy person I've ever come across in my entire life, every single one, they've done one of two things. They started a business or they've invested in real estate. <laughs> That's it, full stop. You wanna be wealthy. So if, if you're building a wealth plan and you wanna be wealthy, well, you need to have a business or invest in real estate. Now there's a third place you should invest and that is investing in you because you are your number one asset. You are the golden goose. There's no better money you can spend than investing in you. So if you want to be a real estate investor, join a real estate investing group, spend the money. It'll be the best money you've ever spent. Get a coach. Tiger Woods has a coach. I have a business coach. I have a real estate investing coach. Darren, you're hugely successful in real estate. I think what you have one or two real estate investing coaches. I do. Yep. Yeah. So, so you're, you invest back in yourself. So if you want wealth, that's where you're going to find it. You, your business and real estate. But that's really step two, the investing part. Because the step one is, well, where do we save our money? Or if we have money, where do we store it before we deploy mm -hmm. it into you, your business and real estate? And, and that's what I talk in the book about this hierarchy of wealth. And it's you know really just this pyramid. And, and, and there's four levels that with the base level being the most important and that we call that tier one money, the banks call it tier one money, but the base, it's like a house. The most important part of your house is your foundation, same as your building. Without a solid foundation, the rest of it's useless. So the same with your wealth plan, your foundation has got to be a position of control. That's going to be your safe money because things are going to happen. There's going to be emergencies and opportunities and how you deal with those are drastically going to affect your life. So we start with the base. And that has to be cash or cash value life insurance. And I show people why cash value life insurance is a million times better than cash, but both of those you're in control. And then we can redeploy into you, your business, real estate. As we go up the tiers of, this, of the pyramid, we get to the very top into the stock market, mutual funds, you know, uh, derivatives and all that. But that's not where wealth is made. Wealth is made in the bottom tiers where we invest in yourself, you invest in business and you invest in real estate. But again, the foundation has to be that safe money. So we're not looking for the greatest investment. We're looking for a place to save money so we can put it in the greatest investment. I, I have a 19 year old son and I joke with him before he went off to school in September, I sat him down and he'd worked for me in the summer. And then I said, listen, Jake, I love you. You're a great kid. I know you want to get into business someday. I know you want to get into rental real estate someday, but let's face it, son, it's never going to happen. You will never have that opportunity to start your own business. You'll never have that opportunity to, to invest in real estate. 
And you'll also never have a financial emergency. You'll never lose your job. The roof will never go. You'll never have a car accident. So what I think you should do is take your money, put it in an RSP in a nice mutual fund, give up control of it and wait 52 years until you turn 71. And then we'll turn it into a riff and hopefully you have enough to get by each month. Like, like that's absolutely ludicrous when you say it like that. But that's exactly what typical financial planning tells us to do. What happens along the way? Because in theory, it should work, right? In theory, it should be, we put our money into RSPs, mutual funds, whatever. They grow at six, seven, eight percent per year. And they show us the graph, right? They're like, the, the sooner you start, the better off you're going to be. And here's where you're going to end up. So what happens in the middle there? What, what goes wrong for most investors, most Canadians, why they don't end up with that, you know, multi-million dollar retirement that they were expecting? Yeah, well, a couple things. I mean, number one is when you're not in control of your money, all the opportunities in the world can come your way. But if you don't have access to money to take advantage of those opportunities, you're done. Same with emergencies. If, if you think of what the wealthy have figured out, we all have one compound interest curve. And what the wealthy have figured out is don't get off the compound interest curve. Well, the poor and the middle class haven't figured that out because life happens. And what knocks you off that compound interest curve, taxes, fees, volatility, and spending. So, you know, taxes, pretty simple. There's in cash value life insurance, there's no tax. Um, fees, there's next to no fees. Volatility, stock market's huge. There's no, basically no volatility in this standard deviation of about one. But spending is the big one and people spend money. So, you know, I, I talk in the book about the zero line. You get a line and you go into debt, you pay it off. Go into debt, pay it off. So now you end up at zero or, or the saver. They think they're getting ahead because everyone said, oh, you should save and pay cash. So they save, and pay cash, save, pay cash. Well, they still end up at zero because mm -hmm. again, what, what people don't get is you, when you, when you have debt, you pay interest, but when you save and pay cash, you lose interest. So if you save 40,000 and, and, and use it for a car or a property, well, that 40,000, it's not just the 40,000 you lost. It's what that $40,000 could grow to. And that's huge. I think a compound interest, like a, like a snowball, kids are outside, they get a snowball, they're rolling it, rolling it, rolling it. Pretty soon they get the base of a snowman. And what do they do? Well, then they smash it and they start again with the snowball. Well, that's what the saver does when he pays cash. But picture in your case, Darren, if for the next, we could take that snowball and for the next 50 or 60 years, continually roll that snowball for literally 50, 60 years. Think how big that snowball would be. Well, that's really what this, this cash value life insurance allows us to do because we put money in there, it compounds tax-free for life. And let's say, we'll just use small numbers, you get $50,000 of cash in there. And you come to me in a few years and you go, Darren, listen, I got this property in Red Deer, great spot, single family. I want to put a, a legal basement apartment in. It's going to be great cash flow. I need $40,000. Let's smash the snowball and let's, let's do this, this, this deal. And I want to say, well, no, let's keep your snowball compounding. Let's keep it compounding for the rest of your life tax-free. But let's go to the insurance company and say, hey, Darren needs $40,000 of your money. And the insurance company is going to loan you that 40000 Now, why would they do that? Well, number one, it's contractual. They're contractually obligated to loan you 90% of the cash value, no questions asked. Sorry, they will ask you two questions. They'll say, Darren, do you want a check or do you want a deposit in your bank account? <laughs> That's it. Now, why would they do that? Well, all lenders look at, you know, what, what's the backing for this loan? If I'm loaning you on a mortgage or a private lending, what's the backing? Well, the backing for this loan, in this case, the 40000 is you have $50,000 of cash value. And that cash value is guaranteed it can't go below 50 or 100 or a million, whatever, whatever, you're, whatever you hit, it can't go below. It's guaranteed to go up every year. And it's paid a dividend every year for 150 years. So from the lender's perspective, they're like, this is great. The third thing is it actually focuses cash value. But at the end of the day, it is a life insurance contract. So it does come with a death benefit. So use me in this case. I have a $50,000 cash value in there and I have a $500,000 death benefit. Well, if I borrow 40,000 on that and get hit by a bus the next day, well, 40,000 goes to the insurance company to repay the loan and, four, and 460,000 go, goes to my family completely tax-free. And then the last thing is they charge you an interest rate on this loan. And that's somewhere between four and 5% typically. But let's talk about what kind of loan it is because this is the cool part. You, you take that $40,000 loan. 
And that loan is uncallable. You lose your job, you market crashes, the property goes down in value. It's tax deductible. So if you use it for a real estate business, um, stock market, it's tax deductible. But here's the big one. It is an unstructured loan. And the unstructured loan is a real estate investor's best friend. Because you pay it back when you want, how you want, or if you want. Now that's huge. When you want, how you want, and if you want. So we do that $40,000 basement suite and then your Red Deer property. You got great cash flow coming in. You say, all right, I'm going to pay back that $40,000 loan with the cash flow, 2000 bucks a month. So you do that for 10 months. Things are going well. And then all of a sudden, financial disaster hits. That financial emergency. COVID comes back. Your tenant trashed the place. The insurance isn't paying. Everything's blowing up in your business. That's the emergency. Or what if another amazing opportunity comes your way and you're like, holy cow, I can make a ton of money at this, but I need access to money. So first thing we're going to do, stop that $2,000 a month payment, done. You're in charge. You are the bank. That $20,000 you paid back in the last 10 months, well, let's fire that right back in your bank account so you can deal with this emergency or take advantage of the opportunity. The three grand that we've had in growth in the last 10 months, let's put that in your bank account. So now you got $23,000 in your bank account and we've stopped a $2,000 a month payment. Now, you still have an outstanding loan, but the point is you are in control. You're not beholden to the bank. You are the bank. So the, my three favorite words, control, we've created an and asset. So we've multiplied the money. It's in the policy growing, and it's also in this basement apartment. So we have money in two places. It's not an or asset. Most people look at, do I put money into RSPs or do I do real estate? Well, this is an and asset. Money's going to be in the contract. Whether you have a loan or not, it grows exactly the same and it's out there. And then we've achieved what the wealthy want, compound interest, not just for a little bit, but uninterrupted compound interest forever and ever and ever. I'm assuming I'm, I'm putting in a monthly deposit into this until it builds up to a certain threshold. And then I've got the ability to borrow against that or borrow funds from this, from this life insurance policy. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, it's, it's not that you, you know, day one, you put in a dollar and you borrow a million bucks. It, it is, it is a building up in year one, Year one's the tough year. It's kind of like doing a renovation, right? You're going to be a little underwater year one. But once we get through that first year, then we're going to continually build and compound forever and ever. And once you get enough in there, now that can be annual, lump sum. We get all kinds of ways to get it in there. But yeah, basically you get it in there. It's going to grow somewhere around, you know, four to five percent, maybe three and a half to five and a half, depending upon the ages. Uninterrupted compounding, and it's uncorrelated to the stock market. So there's, there's, there's never been a year in 150 years where it hasn't paid a dividend. So it's boring, but effective. And how is that? Like, what is it invested in or what is it sitting in that it's able to earn interest at a, at a rate like that? That's uh, first of all, not interrupted. And then also is going to not fluctuate like the stock market. The key to this is that it's called a participating whole life. There's only four products like this in the country. So it's, you know, 99%, 99.9% of insurance contracts aren't like this. And, and most people don't know how to structure them properly to build the cash. But these ones are, are, are what we call participating whole life. And the fund is actually owned by the policyholders. But the fund, what do they invest in? So we'll take one of the companies I deal with, they get a $12 billion fund. Well, they invest that fund exactly like real estate investors. They invested in some debt, some mortgages, some real estate, um, uh, private deals, uh, infrastructure, 407 series, highway, bridge, PEI, and then a little bit, but 15% in, in, uh, in the stock market, but predominantly on long-term stuff. But the key is, you know, if you sell, a, the actuary says, if we've got a policy for a 40-year-old, well, we can play with that money for the next 40 or 50 years before we need to pay a death benefit. So we can invest that long-term, get some better, better returns, and we can invest tax-free. And that's the key cash value inside a life insurance policy grows tax-free and you do the math of paying tax at 40 or 50 percent for the next 40 years versus zero tax it's it's mind-blowing and why is that darren like why is it that it's tax-free uh, is it just that it's the simple rules of the of the law and that if it's in a life insurance policy it's not taxed is that correct? yeah section 148 of the tax code so it's not a it's not a gray area it's black and white uh, th these products have actually been around longer than the than than the tax code I mean, we get a product we, that goes back to 1846. The newest one we use is about 100 years old. So this isn't a latest, greatest get rich scheme. This is a, this has been going on forever and ever and ever uh, before we even had tax code. 
a lot of people hear uh, financial planning, they hear all these things. And as, as, as sort of the new way of thinking, it's like, what are the fees that I'm going to pay on, on the, on the backside that, you know, that uh, is, is a big reason why a lot of people's uh, wealth is eaten up inside their mutual funds is because we're paying high fees. Is it similar on this product or what's the difference there? Yeah, well, this, this is cool. So, so of, the, of the thousands of investment products or, or places to store your money in, in, in Canada, there's four specific products. So those four participating whole life funds I talked about, these are the only ones that are actually federally regulated with respect to how much they can charge for fees because the fund itself is owned by the policyholders. The government came in years ago and said, we need to protect these policyholders because they own the fund. We don't want the big bad insurance companies charging them all kinds of fees. So the average mutual fund in Canada is still 2.2%, which is mm. ridiculous, but that's the average fee. Now these four specific funds are actually federally regulated what they can charge for fees. And they range, in, range from between 12 and 18 basis points. So let's take 15. 15 basis points is 0.15% versus 2.2. So an incredibly low fee product that's guaranteed to go up every year, can't go backwards and has a 150 year track record. And I think people get confused by that, like 2.2, because they're like, oh, it's only 2.2%. But if your return is only 6%, that's a third of your money going to pay fees for your financial planner. So this is the difference where that 0.15 is such a small percentage of your overall return. Yeah. And, and again, like the, 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 the 2%, it's even more because it compounds, that compounds as well, because it's not just the 2% you pay this year. It's what that fee you paid this year could have grown to. So when you start doing long-term projections on what those fees, fees cost you, it's astronomical. Well, and you, you pay them in the downtimes too, whether you're exactly. making money or losing money. So yeah, I, 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 I have to ask like you, Darren, this. why are more people not doing this? Like, is it just a simple case of uh, not knowing about it? Or, or maybe I'm just naive. <laughs> like, why is this not more common? Because I talk to a lot of real estate investors. And obviously, you're one of the first ones I've ever heard about this high cash value life insurance policy inside of real estate investing. Yeah, it, it is more common than people think of. I mean, about a billion dollars went into whole life last year in Canada. So it's, it's, it's bigger than they think of. But the banks can't sell it. The banks don't want to, the, the banks don't want you in control. But financial advisors don't want you in control. They want to be in control of your money. They want you to give up control, put it in a nice mutual fund and wait another 40 or 50 years. The people that I, I deal with, business owners, real estate investors and farmers, well, they get it because they're already used to not following the herd right? The, the herd says, get a job, put an extra couple hundred bucks in my way, my RSP, wait 45 years, go to Florida, have supper at three o'clock, pull my belt up, you know, that, that's, that's my life. Well, I find the wealth, even the wealthiest people I deal with are the easiest ones because they're like, yeah, I don't follow the herd on anything else. So great, mm -hmm. this is it. Um, if you can do this, this and this, I don't, I don't care what you call it. Versus I find some of the, you know, the tentative people, the, 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 the middle class people are like, well, you know, my banker said I shouldn't do this. And I'm like, is your banker a real estate investor? Is your banker an entrepreneur? Is your banker rich? But how does it really benefit real estate investors versus uh, uh, other people? Real estate investors. So think of, think, think you're going to put a dollar into the stock market. Now, how many jobs can that dollar do? Basically one job. It's hope. You hope it goes up in value. I mean, that's basically it. But let's look at properly purchased real estate. How many jobs can that dollar do? Well, you put your money into rental real estate. What are you going to have? You're going to have passive appreciation. Your property goes up in value. You can have active appreciation. You do a rental, positive cash flow. Hopefully, you've got tax benefits. You're going to write off depreciation and interest. You've got principal reduction. You've got your tenants paying down your rent, and you get the power of leverage. Leverage is the ultimate multiplier. If I buy a unit for a hundred thousand and I pay cash and it goes up ten grand, great. I make ten percent. I buy that same unit, I only put $20,000 down and finance the rest, still going to go up 10 grand, but now I've made 50%. So now we get six jobs that $1 is doing as opposed to one in the stock market. That's why I, I love real estate investing and think properly, properly purchased, it's way safer than the, than the stock market. Mm -hmm. But if we take that thousand year old or couple thousand year old strategy of real estate, and we combine it with this couple hundred year, year old strategy of this high cash value life insurance, and we save our money, we store it in the insurance contract first, and then we literally multiply it. We keep it in the insurance contract, but we multiply it back into real estate. Well, then how many other jobs is our dollar doing? 
well, we're going to have that uninterrupted compounding for life. It's going to come with a death benefit. Comes with creditor protection. You can go sued or get bankrupt. They can't touch your money. Comes with terminal illness that if you're terminally ill, they'll advance 25% of your death benefit for, for one more trip to Vegas. Um, it can come with a disability waiver if you select that, that they'll pay your premiums if you're disabled. Uh, comes with a death benefit. For, for me, I was spending $2,500 a year on term insurance. And now I put enough of cash value in that my cash value is also providing a death benefit, comes with this death benefit. So I eliminated $2,500. So I'm term in term, so I was able to do multiple jobs. And then the huge one for real estate investors, and this is why 50% of my clients are real estate investors. When you take a loan from a cash value life insurance policy, properly structured one, that loan does not affect your borrowing capacity. Mm. So in other words, the banks do not consider this a loan when you borrow against your insurance policy. So when you go buy a place and you put 80% down and you get the 20% cash from the, from the insurance company using their money while your money's still compounding, you're effectively financing 100% of it, but the bank's okay with it because it's not considered a loan for borrowing capacity. And, and that's, that's huge. Um, mm. So we're not going to do like there's 16 jobs you can do. We're not going to do all 16 jobs every year, but you start doing three or four jobs with in real estate and three or four jobs with this cash value life insurance, all with the same dollar. Well, that's how we collapse time. That's how we accomplish in 10 or 15 years what most people take 15 or 20 years to accomplish. So, Darren, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to uh, walk us through this. I really appreciate it. I think it's be hugely valuable for many people that have just not been exposed uh, to this product. So thanks for, for doing this. If you guys enjoyed the session with Darren, which I know you did, hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and feel free to leave comments or questions for either of the Darrens. And we'll, uh, we'll definitely take care of those questions for you. Uh, you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, uh, Darren, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time today. I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey. And hopefully uh, our, cross, our paths will cross at some point in the near future. Thank you.